Okay, hi everybody, it's a time for the second half of the 2016 Higher Physics Paper Multiple Choice Part 2. We're going to start at question 13. We managed to get up to question 12 last time we were here. There's your data sheet, same as usual, all the useful information that you might need. And let's scroll all the way forward then to question 13. Is it? Is that where we're starting? Yes, we did photoelectric effect the last time. That's a question 13 on interference of waves using a grating. We've defined the separation of the slits on the grating. And we know that the angle between the first order maximums on either side of the central maximum is 36. So the angle from the central maximum to the first order fringe must be half of that. It must be 18. And then we can use our grating equation, m lambda equals d sine theta, to work out what the separation of the slits is, the small d we're looking for. So theta in this relationship is always the angle measured from the central maximum to, well in this case it's the first order fringe, so m that we are going to use in this case is 1. So we can rearrange this relationship. Uh, to get d, so d will be lambda over sine theta, that's 633 times 10 to the minus 9 divided by sine 18. And if you do that on your calculator, you're going to get an answer of 2.05 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. And that corresponds then to answer c. Moving on, question 14, light travels from glass into air. Right, be careful with this one because it's glass into air, not the usual air into glass that we're used to. So when it goes from glass into air, the speed is going to return to normal, so it's going to the speed's going to increase. Now frequency, remember frequency always stays the same, number of waves per second always stays constant and the wavelength will increase as well when it goes from a glass back out into air again. That's tricky, That's quite unusual. There you go, but 14, answer E. Number 15 is the irradiance. The irradiance of light from a point source is 32 watts per square metre at a distance of 4 metres. What will the irradiance be at 16 metres? Well, you could just go straight to your relationship sheet and do I1 D1 squared equals I2 D2 squared. And it's I2 that we are looking for. So we could substitute in all the values first or rearrange it first. So I1 is 32 times 4 squared will be equal to I2 times the new distance is 16 squared. Don't forget to square your distances. Rearrange for I2, so 32 times 4 squared over 16 squared, and if you do that on your calculator, you will get 2 watts per square meter, and 2 watts per square meter corresponds to answer C. Right, question 16, this is energy levels in an atom. X and Y represent two possible electron transitions. And we have to state which statements is or are correct. Remember, small jumps, small energy difference. So that's a small frequency of photon. So a longer wavelength of photon will be emitted. Let's look at the statements. Transition Y produces photons of a higher frequency. So that's a bigger jump, more energy, higher frequency. That's correct. Statement 1 is correct. That's true. Statement 2, transition X produces photons with a longer wavelength than transition Y. Well, I've already written that on there. Yes, so that's right. Smaller jump is a longer wavelength. That's true. And when the electron is an energy level E0, down at the very bottom, it's ionized. That's false because E0 is the bottom state. E0 is the ground state. That's the lowest energy, uh, energy level. For the atom to be ionised, the electron would have to escape from the uppermost level. So, true, true, false. 1 and 2 is correct. That's 
answer B, 1 and 2 only. Question 17, we've got an AC signal on our oscilloscope and the time base control is set at 2 milliseconds per division. The Y gain is 4 millivolts per division. And we've to figure out which row in the table shows the frequency and the peak voltage of the output of the signal generator. So it's easiest to do the peak voltage first. That's the height of the wave measured from the middle to the peak, which in this case is three boxes or three divisions. And each division we are told is four millivolts. So four millivolts times three divisions is 12 millivolts. That's the peak voltage, so it can only be A or D, so you could have a guess here. But, of course, we can work out the frequency as well. Remember from your National 5 relationships, the frequency is equal to 1 over the period of the wave. And the period of the wave is the time for one wave. Now, we can determine that from the diagram there. One wave takes up one division horizontally. And if we look at our time base control, we're told that each division horizontally is 2 milliseconds. So the period of the wave must be 2 milliseconds. So the frequency is 1 over that. 1 over 0 0.002 is 500 hertz. 500 hertz then corresponds to answer D. Moving on then, question 18. And question 18 is a voltage divider or potential divider. This is like a National 5 question. We have to work out the potential difference across the 7 kilo ohm resistor. That's the bottom resistor there. Well, we can go straight to our National 5 relationship for working out one of the voltages in a series circuit. And that relationship will be V2 equals R2 over R1 plus R2 times the supply voltage. Remember, you can still get asked National 5 questions in your higher paper. So, 7 over the total resistance. Total resistance is 10 ohms, so 7 over 10 times 12 is 8.4 volts. That's answer D. On we go then. Question 19. This looks like internal resistance here. The resistance of a variable resistor is increased and corresponding readings on an ammeter are recorded. And these results show that as the resistance increases, the power dissipated in the variable resistor... Mm. This looks like we're going to have to work out power for each of these sets of readings. So again, we're going to need a relationship that we met in National 5 that relates power with current and resistance... And that relationship is P equals I squared R. And for each of these columns of values, we're going to work out P equals I squared R. So for the first column, it's going to be 2 times 2 squared, which is 2 times 4, which is 8 watts. So when the resistance was 2 ohms, the power was 8 watts. That's the first column, and we're going to do it again with the second column. Let's do P equals I squared R, and work out what the power dissipated is when the current is 1.5. So it'll be 1.5 squared times the resistance of 4 ohms, and that gives us 9 watts. So the power's going up, but let's, let's keep going, just in case. Let's check this one. P equals I squared R. This times a current of 1.2, so 1.2 squared times 6 gives us mm, 8.64 watts. Power's going down again. Let's check the last column. P equals I squared R is 1 squared times 8. Well, that's just 8 watts. So the power has gone from 8 up to 9 and then back down again. So the power increases and then decreases again. The power was at its greatest when the resistance was 4 ohms. Hmm. Interesting. Nice question. Question 20, last one. This was in the 2015 paper as well. A 20 microfarad capacitor is connected to a 12 volt DC supply. 
the maximum charge stored on the capacitor is. Well, we're going to use our capacitance relationship. C equals Q over V. Rearrange it. Q equals CV. Substitute in C for capacitance. 20 times 10 to the minus 6 times the voltage is 12 volts. Gives us an answer of 2.4 times 10 to the minus 4 coulombs. So that's answer B. Why does this question come up quite a lot? It's because people confuse the symbols for capacitance and charge. C is for capacitance. Q is for charge. Although charge is measured in coulombs. And uh, the abbreviation for coulombs is a C. So it can be quite confusing. Watch your C's and Q's. Okay, that's the 2016 paper. We will see you in the next one.